joining the head and the heart. Rabbi Ashlag tells us that the basis of a person's nature, called the ego, expresses itself primarily through two main vehicles. One, mocha, the intellect. This is the rational part of a person, which expresses itself in his desire for knowledge and his desire for control over his life. The desire of the ego, as expressed by the mind, is that he wants to understand the reason for the events of his life and the purpose that underlies every action. The second vehicle is Liba, the heart. This is expressed by the ego's desire for pleasure, both sensual and emotional. It is primarily concerned with itself as it sees other people as a possible threat to its own enjoyment. It has difficulty feeling the feelings of others as it feels itself to be king. If it does decide to do something for anyone else, it is because, underneath, it feels it has something to gain by it. These two main aspects of the ego, the mind aspect and the heart aspect, function in a more or less integrated way in the human being. The ego is a vital part of a person's nature and in fact is given to us by God as part of the purpose of creation. It is a development of the vessel with which, in its transformed state, we will be able to receive all the good that God intends to give us. The sages tell us that the ego is in fact the only created aspect of the person. It is known in the Kabbalah as Yeshmi Ayn, which implies something new, something newly created which did not exist prior to this. The other component of the person is his soul. The Kabbalists tell us that the soul shares the same essence as that of God, but it is a part, whereas God is a whole. They liken the relationship of the soul to God to that of a stone hewn from a mountain. Just as a stone has the same essence of the mountain from which it came, so does the soul have the same essence as that of God. The stone is separated from the mountain by the pickaxe. Likewise, the soul is separated from God by the ego. Since the soul is enclosed by the garment of the ego, we are less aware of our soul than we are of our ego, and it is harder for us to access. Unlike the ego, the soul is not created. But the sages tell us it is an emanation of God's essence, yesh mi yesh, isness, something which always is, eternal. We need to ask the question, in what way does the ego separate us from God? And why should this be so? since it was God who created it and placed it within us? The answer to this question lies in the purpose of creation. We ourselves cannot see the purpose of creation, but there were great sages who through their extreme purity attained what God's purpose was in his act of creation. From them we learn that in the purpose of creation is that God desires to give pleasure to all the created beings. In order for this purpose to be carried through, of necessity, there was stamped within the created beings a will to receive all that God wants to give them. This will to receive originates in the Ein Sof and comes through the spiritual worlds until it incarnates in the human being. It further develops finally manifesting as the ego, or as Rabbi Ashraf calls it, the will to receive oneself alone. At this point, the ego becomes egoism, receiving one's own pleasure, considering only one's own needs, without care for the other person or for the creator who gave him all he has. As we know, the initial formation of the ego is in childhood, but it continues to develop throughout the years of a person's life. However, since the ego is formed by the will to receive pleasure, 
This is actually opposite in direction to the purpose of the Creator, who wishes to give pleasure to the created beings. The action of receiving being opposite to that of giving. There is a spiritual principle which states that just as space separates physical beings from each other, so does difference in desire, known as difference of form, separate spiritual entities from each other. So now we see why the ego, in its final form, in this world, is actually in opposition from that of the Creator. As long as the person is ruled by his ego and acts to fulfill its desires, he will be unable to connect with the Creator or to his own soul. He will be unable to receive the light that emanates from the Creator as there is very little contact. The ego enclosed the soul and it's the ego's difference of form which separates the soul from God and therefore acts like the pickaxe, just like the stone and the mountain. This is really a paradox. On the one hand, we're given a nature that is a direct consequence of the purpose of creation. On the other hand, if we use it, we end up separated from the Creator and from our deepest inner self. The way out of this paradox, the way through, lies in another step of the process. This step is called the tikkun of creation, or the transformation of creation. This means that instead of using those energies developed by the ego in its own service, in the service of the ego, which will only separate us from God, we can take these same energies and use them in a way which serves the soul, which serves God, in a way which brings us back into affinity of form with the Creator. The tikkun of creation is actually the reason for the person's life. And indeed, in this respect, the human being is unique out of all the spiritual cosmos because he has the ability to transform the vessel of receiving so that he becomes a vessel for the light in affinity with his soul. This process of tikkun was given to us in the divine revelation by Moses on Mount Sinai. The instructions for it consist of Torah and mitzvot. Undertaking this tikkun is more than a lifetime's work. It cannot be achieved in one step. Indeed, Rabbi Ashlag teaches us it is a process which requires four stages until we get to its end. We actually reincarnate time and again, building on the work of our previous lives as we progress through all four stages. As the sages and ethics of the fathers teach us, it is not up to us to finish the work, but neither are we free to desist from it. The first stage is the stage we mentioned above. It's the stage of the development of the ego, wherein a person lives only for the sake of gaining pleasure for himself. But from the age of Bar Mitzvah, which is 13 years for a boy and 12 for a girl, the soul, which is longing to reunite with his essence, begins to wake up. He has a chance now. This is why this is the age when the person is obliged to perform Torah Mitzvot. This Tikkun is not an inevitable stage, and many never progress to it, and it depends on the work of the individual. The power of Torah mitzvot consists of the fact that within the Torah and its practical application through the mitzvot, there is a light which is necessary for the transformation of the ego. This light is one with the light of God and the light of the soul. The Talmud tells us the Torah is the healing spice for the will to receive oneself alone, the egoism of our created nature. I created the evil inclination. I created the healing spice of Torah. We saw earlier that the ego expresses itself through the mind by its desire for a rational explanation for everything. Torah and mitzvot transform this expression of the ego through the practice of faith. When we use the paradigm of faith, 
We go against all our rational and logical inclination. Faith shakes the ground of certainty under our feet. It makes us feel rocky and insecure. Yet the prophet Habakkuk taught that all of our Torah rests on faith. Now by Ashlag refers to the attribute of faith as being higher than knowledge. Faith consists of belief in the Creator as the master of the world and his, in his exquisitely exact divine providence with which he cares for each one of us and in his boundless love for us all. Faith comes to us through the practical work of Torah and mitzvot. Our study of the Torah and our prayers when we daven help us bring this faith more and more to the forefront of our lives. It's stretched by the performance of mitzvot, which we do to serve the Creator. We do mitzvot that on the surface don't seem logical. As we grow in our affinity of form of the Creator, only then does the inner significance and meaning of these mitzvot become clearer. Before that happens, we have to do the mitzvot just on trust, just on faith. And that is why, when the children of Israel first received the commandments on Mount Sinai, they answered, Na'aseh v'nishma, we will do and then we will understand. That is, we will first act and then understand the meanings as we grow in affinity of form with God. The transformation of the heart, which is the ego's desire for pleasure, is through the practice of loving kindness. This is exemplified by the mitzvot, which we do between man and his fellow man. We try to do them unconditionally. We refrain from doing that which we would not like to be done to ourselves, and we help each other, trying to bring a little extra love, a little extra comfort, a helping hand, without expecting back anything in return, whether in material terms or emotional terms. The practice of mitzvot put a limit on bodily pleasure, making sure that our pleasure doesn't hurt others. They teach us how to delay our gratification in small and subtle ways, step by step, and with exquisite attention to the detail of our lives, the mitzvot call us back from the strident demands of the ego to the soft whisper of the soul. Gradually, the ego starts to loosen its hold on us, and we begin to feel a more subtle satisfaction and deeper joy when we come closer to the Creator. The correction of the ego from the perspective of both Libra and Moha, heart and mind, into affinity of form with the Creator, brings us to form a vessel fit to receive the light of the Creator. Now we begin to feel something of the awe of the Creator, the greatness of the Creator. The growing conscious awareness of the greatness of God, of his miracles and goodness, helps us in the work of faith and love and ultimately leads us to the complete unification of heart and mind. This audio recording is brought to you from the Horus School, established by Yadida Cohen for the study of the Kabbalah as taught by Rabbi Yehudalev Ashlag. Studies with Yadida Cohen are available through the Nahoa School online. Details at www.nahoraschool.com or www.nahoraschool.com.